Welcome back to another lecture from Introduction to Neuroscience. We have an action-packed sequence today. We're talking about the action potential, and that is the neuron solution to how to pass messages without fail across really long distances. If we were to review what we talked about in the last couple of segments, what I really told you is that according to what we know about the passive and active properties of neurons, whenever something changes, like you inject current of some kind, the cell responds by exponential depolarization and hyperpolarization, and also exponential decay in, 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 uh, in, in space. In other words, whenever something changes, the cell most certainly does respond. It can respond quickly, it can respond slowly, it responds, but then that response decays in time and in space exponentially. So this is kind of a problem, right? We can't, we can't pass messages this way. This, this is never gonna get anywhere. If you're an animal and you actually need to get a message from one side of your body to another to evade a predator, to hunt for prey, to search for home, to find food, to find your mate, these messages are going to get lost if all that's happening is exponential decay <laughs> in all different points, right? So the solution here is that we're not going to rely on exponential decay. We are going to invent a whole new way of encoding and representing electrical messages that is more like um, looking at and making a self-reinforcing wave packet, a packet of, of electrical potential so that as it travels throughout the cell, it actually doesn't change and it reinforces itself. So this lecture is going to be all about the mechanisms of how that happens, how do we make a self-reinforcing wave packet and have it pass through the cell. So in summary, we're gonna be going through and unpacking this diagram here by looking at the feedback mechanisms that sustain the action potential, both in terms of positive feedback and negative feedback. So let's get into it. This is an action potential. This is, this is the iconic picture that everyone thinks about when we think about an action potential. The action potential has this very characteristic shape. It differs somewhat depending on the animal and the cell, but it always has the following shape where it, starting from rest, it goes up, comes back down, overshoots a little bit, and then over a slightly longer time frame goes back to resting. Now here you'll notice that I've drawn everything in terms of the resting potential being negative relative to zero, right? So the membrane voltage is always zero. We have down here the nurse potential of potassium and the nurse potential for sodium because they're opposites as we talked about in the lecture on the resting potential. Because they have rest, they have opposite resting uh, equilibrium concentrations, and they're both positively charged ions. They essentially have opposite nurse potentials, and these are the electrical forces where all things being equal, if you let it, potassium is going to want to make the cell membrane more negative, and sodium is going to want to make the cell membrane more positive because there's so much of it on the outside and so much of this one on the inside. So we're starting from rest because at rest the cell is more permeable to potassium and only slightly permeable to sodium, and so the rest potential of a cell tends to be pretty negative and close to the, to the, to the <laughs> to the nurse potential of potassium. So that's where we start, okay? We start at something that's kind of negative and close to the nurse potential of potassium. The first thing that happens in uh, this action sequence is that we need to introduce a whole new type of ion channel. Now, Everything we've talked about so far has been passive ion channels. I've used the analogy of a door, right? A door that's just, it's, it's open all the time. It's a resting channel, it just kind of stays open. And you know, if you're the right type of ion, you can go in and out and as you want to. And what we're looking at here is something that is similar in that it is an ion channel, right? And it has specificity for ions just like the resting ion channels do. Right? If you have to be the right type of ion, if you are sodium, not a potassium, you can't go through the potassium ion and so forth. And it even has a similar structure in which it has these four components forming a helical pore and the ion is supposed to go through the middle of the pore. Okay, so that's all the same so far as the other, other ion channels we talked about. And its selected mechanism is also approximately similar by looking at the size of the pore. Um, these ion channels are able to be selective for one type of ion instead of another one because they just don't fit uh, because they're too big or if they're too small, then they're not well stabilized by the, uh, by the side chains that are lining the side of the helical pore, okay? Again, so far so good. These are same ion channels. The magic here is that these ion channels have an additional part, they have a special trick up their sleeve, which is what they have an activation gate. They are not open all the time, and they're only open when the cell is already depolarized. That's a terminology here. That's why it's called voltage gated. 
these ion channels are open when the voltage of the cell is already depolarized. This is instantiated by what's called the activation gate, which is uh, at the location in the protein that's pointed to there. It is essentially a voltage sensor. It's closed, and when a depolarization comes along, either because I've injected current as an experimenter, or my neighboring patch of cell is depolarized, or there's a shining of light, and there's a you know, sensitivity of some kind, okay, a variety of reasons. For whatever reason, if a cell is already depolarized, this S4 domain here, as the voltage sensor knows that that's happened and it swings the pore open. The ion channel opens in response to voltage depolarization. It has the same parts as some of the other ion pores that we talked about. There's a selectivity filter, which makes it so that only the correct ion goes through this particular pore. And it has one more trick up its sleeve. This one's a little bit fancier than the other on the ion channels. In addition to being um, voltage gated, so it only opens when there's a depolarization, it also has what's called an inactivation gate, which is essentially on a timer, right? When, it's, when the pore has been open for a little while, the inactivation gate moves in and blocks the channel. So even if the cell is still depolarized, this ion channel will close. So it's got two fancy features in addition to the ion filters we talked about before. It has a voltage gated sensor, so it has an activation gate, and it has an inactivation gate. So when there's a depolarizing event in the neighborhood, this ion channel will open, let the ions through, and then after a little while, it will close. That's what it's gonna do, okay? So armed with this knowledge, what we're gonna do is think about once again, the action potential by going through the different steps and thinking about what's actually happening at each and every different phase of this action potential. Because what that voltage-gated ion channel does for us is allow us to think about what's happening in terms of the membrane voltage when G, the conductance, is not constant. It's actually changing, and it's changing as a function of the membrane voltage. So, in the first step, What's happening is that we're at rest, okay? And there is a huge difference between the membrane voltage and the nurse potential. I mean, we're talking about like, you know, 60 plus 80 millivolts here, really big, right? However, because there's no sodium channels open, there is nothing happening. Sodium channels are relatively closed. Most of them are closed at rest. And so even though there's this huge voltage difference between the membrane potential and the nurse potential of sodium, nothing is happening because we're at rest. Next, what's gonna happen is a little bit of depolarization is gonna come along, okay? For now, let's just pretend that the neighboring patch of the cell is depolarized and that those ions are spreading over a little bit. And so I'm over here feeling a little depolarization. That's what's gonna cause a positive feedback loop because that depolarization is gonna cause some sodium channels to open. The voltage-gated sodium channels will start to open. As they open, because of this huge difference between where I am and where the sodium wants to be, sodium is gonna come rushing inside the cell. And as sodium comes rushing inside the cell, the cells become further depolarized, which opens more voltage-gated sodium channels. And so everyone gets really excited. More and more channels open, and sodium's coming in faster and faster and faster, and the cell gets more and more depolarized. And that's this rising phase of the action potential. But all things must come to an end. <laughs> this can't last forever. This party can't last forever because what's gonna happen is we're gonna get to near the top of the action potential. And here, what's gonna happen is that as the voltage of the membrane, the membrane voltage gets closer and closer to the nurse potential of sodium, the driving force is going to decrease. And so even though those voltage-gated sodium channels are still open, there are no longer as many sodium ions rushing inside the cell because we're getting close to that happy equilibrium sodium nurse potential, okay? So the current due to sodium is going to get smaller even though all the voltage-gated sodium channels are still open. What's gonna happen next is that the opposite thing is gonna happen because we talked about voltage-gated sodium channels. What I didn't tell you, what I didn't tell you is that there's also voltage-gated potassium channels. I know it's crazy, right? 
The voltage-gated potassium channels have a special property, which is that instead of the voltage-gated sodium channels being really, really excited and they open quickly, the voltage-gated potassium channels have a delay. They will open, but only after a little while. So coinciding with the time where the sodium currents are slowing down, the potassium gates, the voltage-gated potassium channels, are gonna start to open, and that's gonna cause what's called the falling phase of the action potential. In this phase, what's gonna happen is that the sodium channels, the voltage-gated sodium channels, are gonna start becoming inactivated. Remember that inactivation gate I told you about? They're gonna start closing, because they've been open for a while and they just don't wanna party anymore. At the same time, the voltage-gated potassium channels are opening because the cell is still depolarized. So the same mechanism applies. We have these potassium channels, they're voltage gated, they're opening. The membrane voltage is up here, which means that there's a huge difference between where we are and where potassium actually wants to be. And so there's now a large outward current of potassium. Potassium now rushes out of the cell, which causes the cell to hyperpolarize. And there's still a small inward sodium current, but that's getting smaller and smaller as, the, as, all, of the, as all of the voltage-gated sodium channels are closing. So that causes the falling phase and everything goes back down, okay? Just like before, as we get closer to the nurse potential of potassium, the, out, the efflux of uh, potassium is going to slow down as well because it's getting closer to where it wants to be at equilibrium anyway. But it's gonna overshoot resting in what's called the after hyperpolarization phase of the action potential. In this phase, all of the voltage-gated channels have closed. So the voltage-gated sodium channels are closed, the voltage-gated potassium channels are closed, but we've overshot resting for a little bit. And so now all that's really active are the leaky potassium channels that are kind of just on all the time. There's no more so sodium current, and there's only a tiny bit of outward potassium current. And over a longer period of time, that's gonna bring us back to the resting potential. And it's called the upper after hyperpolarization because this is the depolarization followed by the polarization. And this phase is what's happening after the hyper hyperpolarization. That's the action potential. There's a lot of action in a really short period of time. So in a typical neuron, the width of this part of the action potential, the big action-packed part where it goes up and down, is approximately a millisecond. So it goes by really quickly. And we can summarize all of this information by the following two feedback loops, where we have a positive feedback loop that's largely mediated by the voltage-gated sodium channels, and then with some time delay, the negative feedback loop that brings us back down, that's mediated by the voltage-gated potassium channels followed by the leak potassium channels, and that gets us back to the beginning. So if you understand these two feedback loops and the different actors that are involved in, uh, in, in the action potential, this is fairly generic, and it explains every single phase that we, we love <laughs> in the action potential. So I'm gonna review again What's happening are, so there's a, co 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 a few key concepts to understanding the action potential. Because there's a, like I said, there's a lot of action going on and it's going on very, very quickly. But to be clear, there's a few things I wanted to emphasize. The first is that the action potential is caused by transient changes in conductance. These are the G sub Ks and G sub sodium, so it's G sub potassium, G sub sodiums that are changes in conductance, but they're not the resting conductance. These are voltage-gated conductances. They change in time, they change in time really quickly, and they're mediated by ion channels that are not the same ones as the leaky ones we were talking about before. These are special property ion channels that are voltage-gated, and in the case of sodium, also inactivate after a certain time. So, there's a variety of different channels. We're talking about different channels than the ones we talked about in the previous section when we're talking about the resting potential. So that, that's what we have to do to get an action potential. You couldn't have had this happen if all you had were the resting channels we talked about in the previous couple of lecture segments. The second point is that even though there's a lot of action and it's happening really quickly, in the grand scheme of things, very few ions are actually crossing the membrane. We're talking about tiny, tiny local changes right at the membrane where there's huge amount of sodium ions flooding in, but it doesn't actually change the ion concentration of either the inside or the outside of the cell. 
as a consequence, so as a corollary of this, because the ion concentrations do not actually change during the action potential, therefore, the equilibrium nurse potentials of sodium and potassium also do not change during action potential. This is super important, right? Because all along we had plotted the nurse potentials of potassium at negative 80 and the nurse potential of sodium at something really crazy high positive, forgot exactly what it is, um, because they don't actually change during the act potential. The driving forces of the two ions in and out of the cell are the same. If you think about the flow of ion as being a small transient change, it kind of makes sense because relative to the entire volume of the extracellular space and the entire volume of this gigantic cell that could be either really big or really long, it makes sense that a small transient change in the local concentration of, of, of a couple of ions do not change during the action potential. And then last, the, these ion concentrations are going to be still actively maintained by the same sodium potassium ATPase pumps that we talked about previously in the other lecture. And so these are going to be on all the time. And when there's a huge influx and efflux of sodium and potassium, they're going to be immediately and actively restored back to equilibrium very actively by the same sodium potassium ATPase pumps that take energy, they burn energy in the form of hydrolyzing ATP to pump the sodium back out of the cell and pump the, pump the potassium back into the cell. So these are really key concepts to remember to understand the action potential. But you will notice that everywhere we talked about, we told you what happened. I just described the action potential. This is, this is what it is, right? Once again, it's interesting to think about, well, we didn't always know this, right? We as a scientific community didn't always know these were the steps that, under, that, under, that underlie the action potential. How do we come to this knowledge? What crazy experiments that people have to do? What crazy insights did they have back then uh, to come to this to come to this, this understanding. Well, like a lot of other things, the full understanding, as I just explained to you, we came upon kind of slowly. But the first description of the action potential was work, pioneering work by Hodgkin and Huxley. This is back in the 40s and 50s, 1940s and 1950s, where they did a bunch of experiments in the Marine Biological Laboratory on the squid giant axon. Now, I'm going to take a moment to talk about the squid giant axon, because this is a fascinating story of how they were able to do this, both in terms of the scientific content, the experiments they had to do, as well as the theoretical insights they came up with in this collaboration. So Hodgkin and Huxley were working with a squid giant axon for a particular reason. Now, for embarrassingly, for many years when I first learned about this, I think this is a common mistake. I didn't know that it was a squid giant axon. I thought it, it was a giant squid axon, like an axon in a giant squid. Um, but no, in fact, they worked with regular size, quite reasonably sized uh, squids. The squids were regular size. It was the axon that was gigantic in the squid. Now, remember, we talked earlier about the conductance length constants of, uh, of, of the active properties of neurons and how the extent to which the depolarization, the depolarization spreads is proportional to the diameter of the axon. And so larger diameter means it spreads farther. Well, this is why the squid has a giant axon. It has this one gigantic axon because it's super duper important for it to be able to escape quickly from predators. This is its escape response. You'll see how gigantic this axon is, especially relative to all of the other axon that are next to it in this particular nerve here, right? So this is a cross section of the giant axon. You can see how gigantic it is. And every other little circle around it is all of the other nerves whose cross-sections are not nearly as big. This is, in fact, a pretty common feature um, of nervous systems where the nerves that tend to be really fast and need to be fast for a good reason for the survival of the animal would also tend to be a little bit bigger. Okay, so Hodgkin and Huxley especially needed experimentally access to these squid giant axons because back then they needed to be able to measure the difference between the intracellular and extracellular size of the cell. I sort of glossed over that earlier because just all oh, pretend that you can do that. Pretend you can stick an electrode in and stick an electrode out and definitely just measure the, the electrical potential. This is easy, right? Well, it isn't easy and it was never easy. And back then it was actually impossible. They didn't know how to do that back then. The only way they could do it is by sticking a actual wire and they had to get the entire wire inside the inside of the cell, which is why they needed access to the giant axon. It was the only axon that was large enough for them to reliably experimentally get one side of the 
the electrode inside the giant axon, leaving the outside in the salt water, and measure the potential difference between the inside and the outside of the cell. And for that reason, they went out in the boat and caught their squids every day and came back and stuck electrodes in them and measured these beautiful action potentials like the one you see over there, right? It looks quite a bit like that diagram we had earlier. It has that lovely characteristic shape where it lasted approximately a millisecond and it went depolarizing, hyperpolarizing, it overshot a little bit and came back to rest after a certain period of time. And so if they only did this experiment, it would already be really impressive, experimentally speaking. But Hodgkin and Huxley had an additional insight that made their discovery particularly satisfying from a theoretical understanding perspective. Because not only did they measure the action potential, they also developed a satisfying mathematical model of how you might actually get an action potential of that particular shape. In a series of papers, they described both the experiment, how they measured the Ash potential, as well as the following set of equations that eventually became known as the Hodgkin-Huxley equations. So we spent a little bit of time talking about these Hodgkin-Huxley equations and what kinds of insights they had here. So you'll see the first Hodgkin-Huxley equation is slightly, should be slightly familiar to you because you've seen it before when we were talking about the active properties of neurons. Okay, so you'll see that here's I, this is the capacitor, dVdt, we've seen that before, right? And then each of these terms here has a conductance in it along with a V term. So this one is for potassium, right? This is the potassium one. We're talking about the voltage difference to the nerve potential of potassium by G here. And then there's this N to the fourth term, this polynomial term. We'll come back to that later. So this is the one for potassium. Here's one for sodium, which again, where we have a V times conductance term. This here, M and H are two filler variables. We'll get back to that in a little bit. But once again, we have a fourth order polynomial because it's M to the third times H, okay? And here they also have a leakage term, uh, which does not have a polynomial attached. Okay, so let's just focus on these terms for a little bit because we've been talking a lot about sodium and potassium recently. So this part of the equation, along with the fact that there's a DVDT and a capacitance of the membrane, this should look pretty familiar to you already from looking at the previous couple of lectures about the uh, active and passive properties of neurons. What they were able to do was write down these equations and they did not derive them from physical principles. They kind of did it brute force numerically. And this is really interesting because the way they ended up doing the numerical integration is by using one of these uh, hand cranked computational machines like you see down here. Because this history of it, you know, the timing of these experiments is that Hodgkin and Huckley started these experiments at the Marine Biological Laboratory before World War II broke out, and before they were able to finish their experiments, um, the war happened, and so they were both drafted into uh, the war effort. And because of their scientific background and facility with numbers, both of them ended up working in different capacities, um, looking, working with numerical integration machines of that kind to compute parabolic trajectories of rockets so that they were able to figure out what, at what angle they had to be aimed to land where they were supposed to aim. So they got really good at using numerical integration machines of that kind to integrate ordinary differential equations of the physical kind, not of the kind for describing neurons. But after the war, both of them survived, came back to their scientific studies and their collaboration, and they used the they used the skills that they had learned integrating rocket trajectories to integrate these equations. And they did it brute force by cranking on this machine with gloves on because it was the winter and it was cold by the ocean. Now for comparison, if I were to implement the numerical integration of this set of four ordinary differential equations now on my laptop, it would take a trivial fraction of a second to do what they did over laborious work over days to produce the following result, where they're comparing a real action potential versus an action potential as modeled by their equations. And you can see that they are remarkably similar. This is a really fascinating story, how they came upon this particular set of equations. Like I said, the first equation looks familiar because these are terms that we've seen from derivations of the passive and active properties of neurons. These three are 
you know, have a less straightforward physical, have a physical interpretation. But there is a really interesting thing here that's been pointed out to me, so I'm just going to share with you because I think it's interesting. It's a connection between these differential equations and protein chemistry. Because what Hodgkin and Huxley most certainly did not know back then is what we know now, that these ion channels come in helices of four, okay? But as you can see, they fit the data. And in order to fit the data, there are polynomial, fourth order polynomial terms for both the sodium and the potassium currents. This makes sense in the context of the conformation of the protein because these four proteins have a cooperative opening mechanism. And so when there's four of them, when there's a complex of four, there's often in protein, in protein biochemistry a polynomial of order four proportional to the number of different subunits that contribute to that protein because they all four have to open for the voltage-gated sodium and the voltage-gated potassium channels to open. So I thought that there was really cool that they came upon this by fitting the data because they had to. They had to do that. You know, <laughs> they probably tried to the power of three and power of five, and it didn't work as well. So we're like, oh, power of four looks looks good, and to some extent predicted the fact that these voltage gated channels ended up being polymers that had four helices as part of the ion pore. That was pretty cool, I thought. Okay, so. Now comes the part of the lecture where we talk about voltage-gated sodium channels and when things go wrong, because things always go wrong, right? Anytime something is really important in biology, it also goes wrong. And so we can tell stories about what happens when voltage-gated sodium channels go wrong. Voltage-gated sodium channels are so crucial to your bodily function, they underlie everything having to do with nerve activation and muscle activation. And so when things go wrong, they can go really catastrophically wrong. Okay, so here's a couple of examples of pathologies and things going wrong with voltage-gated sodium channels. The first, it's a trototoxin. So this toxin is made by the pufferfish. It is made in a couple of different um, organs of the pufferfish, specifically the intestines, ovaries, and liver of the blowfish. And the trototoxin has the following molecular structure, and it is 1,200... 100, 1,200 times deadlier than cyanide. It's so deadly that a single fish has enough poison to kill 30 people. And the reason it's so potent is because it is a blocker of voltage-gated sodium channels. Can you imagine what would happen to all the different parts of your body if all of your voltage-gated sodium channels started, stopped working? Well, the answer is you die very, very quickly. <laughs> and so that's why it's really important when uh, you're eating a plate of fugu that it is prepared correctly, so you're not ingesting any tetrodotoxin. So that's lovely, um, but beyond being something that is, is something that is a, that is an interesting that is an interesting poison, an interesting toxin. Tetrodotoxin is also a very powerful experimental tool in neuroscience because it allows us to separate the relative contributions of sodium currents and potassium currents when we're thinking about the action potential. So this is really important in the context of neuroscience because oftentimes, especially when there's so much feedback, in these systems, remember we talked about the positive and feedback loops that underlie the action potential. Everything is all, every, everyone influences everyone else, right? And so when you're thinking about what's happening as a scientist, you want to be able to manipulate one aspect of the feedback loop without necessarily thinking about the other aspect of the feedback loop because they're confounding variables. So. Tools like tetrodotoxin are really useful in experimental neuroscience because you can pipette it onto your experimental prep and temporarily shut down all the voltage-gated sodium channels so that we can then separately measure what's happening with the voltage-gated potassium channels. There's a variety of tools like this. Um, so there's a you know, whole catalog of poisons and toxins and assassins friends where we can pipette them onto our experimental apparatus and figure out what's happening with various different kinds of ion channels, hopefully in a way that we can dissociate them from each other. In uh, another <laughs> impressive news, there is an autosomal dominant disease in horses called hyperkalemic periodic paralysis. This, unlike a poison, 
is a missense mutation in a voltage-sensitive potassium channel that is specifically expressed in the skeletal muscles of horses. This is the SCN4A mutation, okay? So the SCN4A protein in this particular disease, in this paralysis disease, causes horses to experience periodic muscle tremors followed by paralysis because their voltage-gated sodium channels don't work, right? So that's not very good because without voltage-gated sodium channels, you can't really control your muscles that well because your neural because your, because your muscles aren't able to respond correctly when they're being commanded by motor neurons to move. Now, the observation is that every single horse that's ever been diagnosed with disease has been descended from a horse named Impressive, who was very impressive indeed because he sired up, uh, over 2,000 fowls. He was a 1974 world champion, and which is very, very successful. And that's why he was bred so much and gave rise to all of these descendants. Um, so what probably happened is that there was a spontaneous mutation in the SCN4A gene in Impressive. Um, and it was a spontaneous mutation because it didn't affect him, but it affected all of his descendants. Um, and also it explains why we have not seen other racehorses with the same disease. All of the ones we've ever seen have been descended from this one particular horse. On the topic of the SCN4A gene, there's another lovely story where is, there's an evolutionary arms race between newts and snakes. So pufferfish are not the only ones that express tetrodotoxin. Newts also express tetrodotoxin. So these newts, as a defense mechanism, just like the topperfish, produce very large quantities of tetrodotoxin because they don't want to be eaten, and they don't want to be eaten by snakes. They secrete it onto their skin, and so they're actually safe to handle as long as you don't eat them, right? You can actually touch them, they're totally fine, just don't lick your finger afterwards, and definitely don't lick the newt. But snakes want to eat the newt. And so in order to defend themselves against trototoxin, which remember earlier, is a potent antagonist and blocks voltage-gated sodium channels, okay? The snakes, in response, have evolved a resistance to trototoxin, specifically by a mutation in the SCN4A gene. So they have a version of a voltage-gated sodium channel that does not bind to tetrodotoxin, so they can eat as much newt as they want to. You can kind of imagine what happened over evolutionary time here, right? That as newts produced more and more tetrodotoxin, snakes became more and more resistant to it and made further and further mutations to the SCN4A gene. And so this is another story where, this, it's not necessarily, it's not a delicious story, but I think it's kind of a lovely story too, where by looking at the molecular mechanisms of these toxins, and their methods of activation, you can then trace them down to the proteins that are affected and the mutations of those proteins that, that, uh, that, that produce either undesirable, in the case of those horses, or actually kind of desirable effects in the case of these snakes because they get to snack on newts when the rest of us cannot. Okay, so we talked a lot about the action potential and so far, we've only really talked about the action potential in time. Okay, so you know what's coming. You've seen my other lectures, so you know what I'm about to say next. The action potential propagates in space. And it propagates in space like a wave propagates in the ocean. So it's a wave of depolarization that goes along the cell in the cylindrical approximation, largely unchanged in shape. So, Unlike the case before, where we were looking at propagations that decayed exponentially, the action potential, because it is actively maintained by the positive and negative feedback loops mechanisms we talked about in explaining the shapes of the action potential, the action potential is regenerated by that mechanism so it maintains the same shape no matter how far it goes, as long as you have the correct voltage-gated sodium potassium channels along the way. So let's walk through how that would happen, okay? So here's my cylindrical axon. At rest, it's relatively negative, so there's negative on the inside, positive on the outside. And we're gonna suppose that the action potential is going over there, okay? So it's traveling in that direction. So what's gonna happen is that the peak of the action potential is gonna be right here, where there's an influx of sodium, super big, right? Because the action potential was traveling to the right, the piece of membrane that follows it has already reached the hyperpolarization phase of the action potential. So it's actually already recovering where there's an efflux of potassium here, 
at the same time, these sodium neurons, sodium, sodium ions, as they enter the cell, are going to diffuse into this fresh piece of membrane here that's never seen the actual potential yet, at least not for the past couple of milliseconds at least, and it's going to cause the voltage-gated sodium channels to open right here in this patch of membrane B, and it's going to start the positive feedback loop portion of what we were talking about. So this diagram actually closely mirrors the positive and negative feedback loop diagram we had earlier, right? Where there's positive feedback loop coming on over here in this patch of membrane, and in time, there's a delay, right? Also in space because of spatial propagation. So this patch of membrane is also already in the negative feedback portion of the feedback loop. So the positive feedback over here, negative feedback over here. And remember, this patch also has the sodium channels, the voltage-gated sodium channels inactivated, so it can't initiate another action potential. So the action potential has to go that way because these are fresh voltage-gated sodium channels that haven't opened yet. They can still open if you depolarize them. The ones over here are tired. They just open. They're going to take a nap, okay? So that's why everything's going to go that way. And every single time it moves a little bit farther along, the shape of the action potential is regenerated by voltage-gated sodium channels and then reinforced by voltage-gated potassium channels. And that's why, just like a wave in the ocean, before it hits the shore, that's different. Just like a wave in the ocean, <laughs> this wave of action potential is going to propagate without degradation over very long distances because it keeps getting regenerated. But we still have a limiting factor because the way in which one piece of membrane excites the next piece of membrane, remember that was A to B in the previous slide, is still limited by the rate at which sodium ions, as they go into the cell, diffuses and then goes to the next piece of cell. That's still a limitation, right? That because the one piece of depolarization at one position in the cell has to sufficiently depolarize the neighboring cell until it's able to regenerate and activate its own voltage-gated sodium channels. That's still a limitation in speed. And remember, by the cable equation from the active properties of the neurons lecture, that portion of the regeneration process of the action potential is still limited by the exponential decay length constant lambda. And that lambda is still proportional to A, which is the diameter of the neuron, of the axon. So we talked about the giant squid, ac no, I keep saying it, the squid giant axon, which solves this problem by having a really large A, so that the action potential can actually go really fast down the length of the axon. There is a need for speed, and the solution is to eat more dessert. Not really, but this picture will make sense to you in a second. Because the other solution, besides having a gigantic axon, is to wrap your axon in what's called myelin. Okay, I'm going to explain what that is, and we're going to work through the mathematics using the derivation we had earlier of why it is that myelin makes a difference in, axo in uh, action potential speed conduction. So, this is a solution that a lot of mammalian systems have come to in the same way that the, the squid has come to the solution of just having one gigantic axon, okay? The way this works in a lot of mammalian cells is that you have your axon in the middle. This is, again, a cross-section of the axon. Um, for scale, I mean, the giant axon was much, much bigger. This is kind of a reasonably sized axon, but it's not going to be alone, right? So my neuron is a regular neuron. It's going to have a regular, reasonably sized axon, but it's not going to be by itself. What's going to happen is it's going to be wrapped with glial cells, and it's going to wrap it a lot. So glial cells here is a kind of a generic catch-all term for all the cells associated with your brain and nervous system that are not actually neurons, of which there are many, and there's different types of glia. So glia is kind of a catch-all term. It's like everything else in your brain that does something important but isn't actually a neuron is called glia, okay? So this particular type of glia has a very special purpose, and its only purpose is to wrap around and insulate the axon. It does so 
by wrapping itself around the axon and then wrapping yourself again and then wrapping it again just the same way that you might make pastry dough or phyllo dough, right? By like, by making yourself really flat, folding it, you roll it again, you fold it again, you roll it and kick. So it's the exact same thing as what happened here with, uh, with the growing of the myelin. And so zooming in, what you'll see there is that effectively, instead of the cell membrane being whatever thickness a regular cell membrane is, is effectively that thick times the number of times the glial cell has wrapped itself around the axon. Going back to our derivations of the cable equation, what we can see is that without myelination, the speed of my propagation is determined by this ratio, just like before, the ratio between the membrane resistance divided by the internal resistance of the inside of the cell. Okay, so, so far so good. Without myelination in the mammalian neuron, usually the speed of conduction is something on the order of one meter per second. That's kind of a, a typical you know, speed conduction, how quickly you can, you can go from one side, uh, from, from one, how, how quickly an action potential would be able to go from one end of the cell to another. So for reference here, let's think about what this actually means in the context of an animal, right? Like humans are approximately a meter tall. So most of us are between one and two meters tall. Like I'm 1.7 something meters tall. So, <laughs> so, so, so let's just go with one meter, all right? So if the speed of conduction without myelination is approximately one meter per second, that means if something hits my toe, it's gonna take my brain about a second to realize it. It's really slow, it's not good enough. I really want to know something hit my toe a lot faster than a second later after it happened because I'm a meter tall, okay? So this is not good, I need to go faster. With myelination, with this kind of phyllo dough wrapping of the axons, what we end up with is an effective increase in the resistance of the membrane. So it is now the regular resistance of the membrane times N n being the number of times the glial membrane has wrapped around the myelin sheath. This is called a myelin sheath. At the same time, it also decreases the capacitance of the membrane. And so the capacitance goes down by a factor of n. Effectively, everything cancels out for the time constant. So the time constant of response is actually still exactly the same. The cell can respond to changes just as quickly as it could before, before we had myelination the length constant of the propagation is significantly larger, which means the same message can actually go farther in the cell without having to be regenerated. Let's think about what this means, okay? This is, it comes with about a one or even two times uh, uh, order of magnitude speed up in speed. So now we're going to like 100 meters per second rather than one meter per second. This is looking more like it, right? Like I can definitely feel something, if something hit my toe or I like kicked something when I was hiking or something, I can most certainly know about it before one meter per second. It's more like 100 meters per second. Let's take a look at what's happening here, okay? We have the axon of the neuron, which is my pipe, my, my, my wire, uh, through which I want to pass information, right, about something that just happened, like I just kicked something, I should probably do something about that. And this axon, instead of being propagating by itself, is actually gonna be wrapped in a series of glial cells that form these segments of myelin sheaths, okay? There's these little segments of it, it's like a little, it's a little, it's like a little hot dog with a bun. <laughs> well, it's like a really long hot dog with a series of buns that are wrapped around it. Now, the places in between the myelin sheath wrapping are what's called nodes of Ranvier. And that's where all of the voltage-gated sodium potassium channels live. They're all concentrated right there. There are very few of them in the middle where the myelin sheath has wrapped the axon. So when you have what ends up happening is that the conduction of the action potential actually is able to skip the wrapped portions. The active properties we talked about of the action potential, whether it's voltage-gated action, voltage channels and action potential regeneration, all of that happens to the nose of Ranvier in between the myelin. So it would go from here and then jump directly to over here gets regenerated and then jumps the next one and gets regenerated again. In between, where there's no voltage-gated channels, we have passive properties of the cell. So the cable equations apply here. 
with the stipulation that it's the version that we had before we just arrived in the a couple of slides ago, where everything is proportional to n, n being the number of times the myelin has just wrapped around my axon. Okay? So my action potential, I'm going to say this in a slightly different way, if there were no myelin, my action potential generated here would be able to be passed down and it would need to be regenerated right here, right? So I have to do it again. And then it could pass along this far, I'm going to do it again, right? With myelin, because the effective length constant of that potential diffusing inside the neuron is lengthened, Instead of having to regenerate them every this much-ish, we can regenerate it much longer in between, thus skipping whole sections of axon and then only regenerating the positive and negative feedback loop that we for the action potential only at the nodes of Ron VA. This is not without cost. Right? We talked about a little bit about the cost of uh, growing a gigantic axon by, by the, 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 the squid solution. Right? So in order to have a really, really fast cable there by having a giant axon, the cost of the animal is that you now have to spend all of the material of growing a large axon and then also maintaining that axon by feeding it, maintaining the ionic potential there and keeping that cell alive. So that's one solution that evolution has found in a variety of animals. This is another solution, and it is not without its costs, right? The cost of the neuron itself might be, might be smaller because not only are my neurons not running a really thick cable, I'm running the same thin cable, I actually save a little bit because I only have to express uh, voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels at the nodes, so I, say, I don't have to I don't have to line the entire thing with voltage-gated sodium channels. I can only have them at the nodes, and that's cool, because that's actually savings, right? The cost, then, is that I have to grow a fleet of these other glial cells whose entire purpose is to wrap themselves like phyllo dough around my axon. I have to keep those cells alive now, and there's actually quite a few of them, right? We talked about over here that these, uh, in a mammalian cell, once again, these nodes tend to be, you know, a few hundred microns to a few millimeters in length, right? So let's just round, let's say one millimeter, okay? Let's say that these, the space between the nodes of Ranvier are like one millimeter. And that means if I were to have to wrap a, a pain receptor that goes from the tip of my finger all the way up to my spine, right? Whatever the, whatever the spinal, spinal portion that, that innervates my, my fingers. This, once again, I'm gonna round here. It's like a meter, okay? It's less than a meter, but I'm gonna round to a meter. And that means to wrap, to myelinate that entire axon to get the pain information from the tip of my finger to my spine. And every, if every myelin, if every glial cell can wrap about a millimeter of axon and I have a meter, that means I have to grow a thousand extra support cells just to support that one axon to get information quickly about pain from the tip of my finger to my nose. So it's trade-offs. Right? These are two different solutions. They're totally valid. Um, not all cells in your, not all axons in your nervous system are myelinated. Lots of, lots and lots of them are not. Myelination is uh, used with caution <laughs> because it is actually kind of costly in its own way. And so what we tend to find is, especially in peripheral systems, it's only the really crucial signals that need to get somewhere really quickly that have dedicated myelinated axons with them. And so some of them travel quickly, some of them travel more slowly. There's actually a diversity of axon diameters as well as myelination in your body right now um, and in a ways that, that people have rules and we'll talk about a little bit about that when we talk about sensory motor systems in a later portion of this course. So of course like always when something is really important things always go wrong, right? So here's a couple of examples when things go wrong with myelinated axons. And so I'm gonna highlight two clinical uh, conditions where the pathologies are known to involve pathologies of myelination. So the first one is multiple sclerosis, which is an inflammatory disease, and it is a demyelinating disease of the central nervous system. And because it is a progressive demyelination disease, the symptoms tend to be 
uh, mysterious and progressive, and so that's why MS has been notoriously difficult to diagnose as well as to treat, because it's a demyelination disease. It doesn't target a particular system, and it's not localized to a part of the nervous system. It really can show up in a variety of different systems at different times, um, and so that makes it um, uh, really, like I said, difficult to treat as well as to diagnose. There's another disease known as a Charcot-Marie tooth disease, a CMT disease, and this one is a demyelination disease that targets the peripheral nervous system. And so this one is really interesting because uh, not only is it devastating as a disease, but from a neuroscience perspective, it's interesting because it targets the peripheral nervous system and it's a demyelination disease. So like I talked about earlier, right? The part of the axon that innervates the tippy, to tip right my finger is longer than the part that innervates the part of my arm that's much closer to my spine, right? So if I have a disease that affects the myelination, it's going to affect the more distal parts more than it affects the proximal parts. And so the deficits that patients experience in sensation and movement are in severity length dependent. So the more distal it is, your toes are gonna feel it more than your calf for example, and then they're going to feel it more than your thigh if you were um, if you were somebody who had CMT disease. So that's sort of an interesting observation that also um, supports this observation that it is a myelination disease, which has to do with the speed of conduction from peripheral parts of your body back to the central nervous system. So. In summary, here's a couple of key concepts that I think are really crucial. I'm gonna remind you, these are things that we learned about that I think are really important to remember when we're understanding the action potential. The first is to remember that the action potential is a self-reinforcing packet of voltage potential and is critically enabled by a new class of ion channels that we introduced in this lecture, the voltage-gated channels. They're ion channels just like the other ones, except they have this special property in that they're not open all the time and they only open when there's already a depolarization in the neighborhood. So this is the feedback loops, right? Positive and negative feedback loops, voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels. The action potentials, not only are they self-reinforcing in time, they are self-reinforcing in space, which allows them to propagate just as a wave would prop propagate along long distances. So a wave in the middle of the ocean will pass largely unchanged over hundreds of kilometers, right? Just the same wave, it'll just keep going. So the same mental image applies here for action potentials. It is the same shape and it will travel like a wave across long distances along, uh, along, the, along the neuron. Unlike an ocean wave, it has to be actively maintained and regenerated. So, so I don't want to take that analogy too far. It's more of like a mental image and less like an actual physical analogy because we do need active maintenance by those voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels to regenerate the shape. And that feedback is crucial. So, and the speed of an actual potential, even though it is super cool and self-regenerating, it's still fundamentally limited by physics and the cable equation. So you can speed it up by one of two ways, and we derived how you would see the effects of these two different solutions to the speed up problem. You can speed it up by having a larger cell diameter, or you can speed it up by myelination, both of which effectively increase the length constant of propagation of the active potential. And then finally, the uh, myelin effectively increases the effective resistance and decreases the effective capacitance of the cell membrane. And because those two terms cancel out in the time constant, but they don't cancel out in the length constant, that's why myelination works. Okay, so that's the action potential. Uh, hopefully you'll come back next time when we start talking about what happens when the action potential gets the end of the line and the cell ends. What happens next? See the next video to find out.